So preparing for the build, as I say, I'm going to be installing this on a USB stick or to, or to make a bootable USB stick, which in theory I could take to any PC and boot from. The thing to bear in mind is with Linux from scratch, by default it will build the architecture you're building on. So if you do really want to make a bootable USB stick, you need to compile Linux from scratch on the oldest machine or oldest architecture that you want to use the USB stick to boot from. And that's because generally um, code that's compiled for a specific version of the architecture will boot on later versions but not backwards. Uh, in theory the compilation could produce instructions that won't work on older processors but will almost certainly work on newer processors so that's something to bear in mind. Um, I'm going to be building this on a very recent machine it's an older lake I've just recently bought but I don't I only intend to show the process of building the USB stick It's not something I really am going to use um, but it will show that you know the process of building it and booting from the USB stick on this machine I, I would be very surprised if it did actually it might boot um, but I wouldn't be surprised if I, or would be surprised if I really got any further with it if I tried to compile stuff using this stick, um, because I, there are some packages, as you'll see as we go through, that will compile specifically for the architecture that you are compiling on. If you do want to compile for an older architecture, then you may want to look at doing a cross compile. I've done a video for that. Um, and that might be a better idea, sort of following that what that needs what needs to be done there, but while bearing in mind like what I do here for building on a USB stick. So before I start the build, what I'm going to do is to prepare the USB stick. Um, now, there's two things here actually I need to mention. Um, yeah, if I go into preparing for the build, and actually start on this. You see the introduction it says uh, it prepares the host tools basically, and that includes the host system. So you need a running host system to build Linux from scratch. It's like a chicken and egg situation. You need an environment, a Linux environment, to create a new Linux environment. Um, and this page gives some host system requirements. Now, um, I'm going to be using this system I've got here, which is a Gen 2 system. It's got everything that's needed for a Linux from scratch. You can use a live, live USB stroke CD to build a system, which is a good way if, for example, you've only got a Windows system um, or you don't want to use an existing Linux system you're booting from. Um, the thing is, most live images don't come with all the tools needed for uh, building Linux from scratch. Uh, a lot of them don't have what they call development stuff such as, it, uh, such as GCC, the compiler, um, and probably bin utils as well, the, the binary utilities. So what I tend to recommend is to, um, you, you can use your own live CD if you wish, but you will have to install um, other packages in that live environment um, and I've got some videos um, uh, I've got a playlist which shows you how to do that uh, if I quickly show you that playlist so I've got a playlist <clears throat> it's this one here host Linux configuration for LFS chapter 2.2 so you'll see we're on chapter 2.2 and this specifies all the all the requirements for that page and within this playlist I've got I think 10 at the time of the most popular live distributions um, as specified by DistroWatch so um, these are the most searched for or were the most searched for distributions on on Distro watch at the time, which is uh, a year ago, the looks of it. Um, so, yeah, if you go through these, it should give you enough information. For example, if you download Fedora, 
that video should give you enough information to install uh, any missing packages within the live environment that will enable you to um, boot, uh, sorry, uh, build Linux from scratch. Um, my recommendation is to go for a live CD, a live USB that has got all the packages already built in that you need, all the development packages. My preferred OS at the moment for that is called Endeavor OS. So this is the home page and you can just download the image here, latest release. Uh, if you just scroll down here, there's some links here to the images. Um, and what you'll get if I shut this down, I can reboot into a USB stick I've already got prepared with the Endeavor OS on it. So you'll get an idea. So just waiting for the machine to reboot. Okay, it's on this. It's only a two gig image, so you can see I've got a two gig USB stick there. Just fits on there nicely. So just waiting for this to boot. So obviously it's a little bit slow because it's off a USB stick and it's USB 2 as well so a little bit slow but there's the uh, screen that appears um, basically don't need to keep this up when the panel starts at the bottom I don't know if I can yeah I can open a terminal rather than wait for it get a terminal up just do sudo su to get root access and if I get a not sure why the panel hasn't appeared at the bottom actually. It might be because I've got two screens up, it might be on the other screen actually. But not to worry, you won't, won't normally have this, You'd, it would come up, the other screen hasn't come on for some reason, but um, generally it works with two screens okay. Oh, right, okay, it's because I'm running it as your root, so Firefox. I'll just put that in the background. Yeah, that looks better. Um, if I go to the Linux from scratch web page here. and go to chapter 2.2, .2. I'll just make this a little bit bigger. So host system requirements. There's a script here which allows you to, let's make this a bit bigger as well. Okay, maybe it was a bit too big, but not to worry, as long as it 
can be read easily. Right, I'll leave that there. So yeah, there's a script here which examines all of the um, packages that you'll need. And if you, let's say, run one of these live images, live distributions that doesn't have all the uh, correct packages, you will get errors appearing here saying that. Um, and basically you can go through this and check that all the versions are correct and as you can see there's no errors here at all um, I'm not going to check the versions here because I'm not going to be compiling in this environment um, but you can see the first one bash it starts there bash 5.1 release and there's a sim link there as well which is what it says here we need 3.2 so the version's fine and bin sh should be a symbolic link or hard link to bash and you can see bin sh is already pointing to bash um, and as I say everything here should be correct it's the latest version of Endeavor OS you won't need to do anything else you can just start building Linux from scratch other distributions most of them you will need to install other packages to get um, packages that are missing by default uh, installed before you can carry on so that was just a quick demonstration that um, Endeavor OS, like I say, is, is ready to go with Linux and Scratch. So I'm going to reboot this and go back into Gen 2 and compile from there. I'm just doing this just for convenience more than anything else. The comp compilation that I'll be showing it will be absolutely no different to that of Endeavor OS if you boot it into live image of Endeavor OS. So I'll just boot back into here. And go back to host system requirements. So here I am in my home directory. I've got the web page on the left, terminal on the right, which we're using a lot of. So as it says, the host system should have the following software with minimum versions indicated, and it should not be an issue for most modern distributions. Also note that many distributions will place software headers in separate packages, often in the form of package name devel or package name dev. So be sure to install those if your distribution doesn't uh, provide them. Um, early versions of listed software packages may work but may not have been tested. I have played devil's advocate and gone with some versions that have been earlier than specified. Um, a couple of times I've got away with it and there's not been any apparent problems. But generally you'll probably find that there's a, some compilation failure as there's some feature missing or or you know something not right something behaves differently so i wouldn't recommend chancing that at all i would uh, just ensure as it says that all the versions are up to date so my gen 2 is not completely up to date it's probably a week or two out of date but it should be more than up to date enough to to be able to pass the test here so if i paste this in press enter and again we look for the first bash version because that's the first package that we need to check which is that one there so I scroll up we just need to check that bash is greater than 3.2 which it is we've got 5.1.16 and also note this is extremely important that bin sh is a sim or hard link to bash which it is you can see it's pointing to bin bash in this case Bin utils we've got 2.37 and we need 2.13 so that's okay. Bison 3.8.2 that's fine then 
it's 2.7 or greater and also user bin yak should be linked to bison or small script that executes bison so yes user bin yak points to something called yak.bison so that looks okay core utils need 6.9 we've got 8.32 diff utils we've got 2, 2.81 2.8.1 is needed we've got 3.8 so that's fine find utils we need 4.2.31 and we've got 4.8.0 that's fine gawk 4.0.1 we've got 5.1.1 gcc we need 4.8 and we've got 11.2.0 um, grep 2.5.1a and we've got Oh yeah, sorry, also GCC, that's the C compiler and the C++ compiler, they're both okay. <coughs> grep, we need 2.5.1a, we've got 3.7. Gzip, we need 1.3.12, we've got 1.11, so that's fine. Linux kernel, 3.2 is required. Um, it mentions there why a specific version is needed. We've got 5.16.11, so that's fine. Um, M4, we need 1.4.10, we've got 1.4.19. Make, we need 4.0, we've got 4.3. Patch, we need 2.5.4, we've got 2.7.6. Perl, 5.8.8 is needed, and we've got 5.34.0. Python 3.4 is needed, we've got Python 3.9.9. Said 4.1.5 is needed, we've got 4.8. Tar 1.22 is needed, we've got 1.34. Text info 4.7, we've got 6.8, so that's fine. And finally, <coughs> X said 5.0.0, we've got 5.2.5. .5. And lastly, it does a little sanity check with the C++ compiler and you can see the compilation is okay so that's a good little sanity check so you can see Gen 2 and up to date Gen 2 is perfectly fine for building this as well as you might imagine because Gen 2 is source a source based distribution like Linux from scratch is so again it just goes over again what's going to be done in the individual chapters some information there um, so that as it says these are accomplished on the host system which is what we're doing now um, and it says if you restart so if you're um, doing this in you know more than one session which is not what I'm going to do I'm going to do this all in one session although it may be split over different uh, several videos uh, it will be one sitting um, that you have to remember that some of the procedures for root after section 2.4 you need to have this LFS environment variable set but we'll see that when we come to it um, chapters 5.6 the partition where we're gonna build the system must be mounted um, chapters 5 and 6 must be done as a user called LFS which we'll be creating um, some general compilation instructions so they are critical um, it's the bit that people don't tend to read or they miss some of the detail and that's where they stumble and get a problem so uh, that is quite a critical part to read chapter 7 to 10 chapter 7 to 10 is the part where again the partition we're building Linux and scratch obviously must be mounted some of the operations must be done as root so again the LFS environment variable must be set for root and then we true into the new environment we've created and again obviously the variable LFS must be set there for that to work and some virtual file systems must be mounted as well so if you're again in this part onwards and you want to shut down and continue the session later on you need to redo these changes here to remount the virtual file systems um, correctly before entering the true um, the troop system so creating a new partition so as I said I'm going to be creating this on a USB stick so I'm going to divert slightly from the book here 
purely because I'm doing this a little bit differently. So what I'm going to do first of all is become root and do a list of my devices and you can see the um, hard disk I've sorry the USB I've got here is SDA for it's actually a it's called a 16 gig it's not actually 16 gig it's probably more like a 15 gig but there we are um, but so I'm left with roughly 14 gigabytes 14 and a half gigabytes of space um, that's probably about the minimum. The, the absolute minimum you, you'd need to build Linux from scratch is probably about nine or ten gig of space, of uh, file space. Um, I have built it. I used to build it quite regularly with an eight gig partition. Uh, I believe it's grown a little bit that it just needs a little bit more than it, exactly eight gigabytes. So you're probably looking at ten, nine to ten gigabytes as an absolute minimum. Minimum, but uh, fourteen should should be plenty of room. For building Linux from scratch. So you can see there's already something on here. So what I'm going to do is to wipe this. Now wipe um, wipe FS removes all the partition entries from a hard disk. So it's quite a dangerous command. Um, and the way I run it is I do minus A to erase all the entries, and I also use the option N to do a dummy run. And then to prevent any errors, rather than typing in the actual device name, what I do is double click it there to highlight it in the terminal and then center click to paste it. So then there's no typos. So, for example, if I did have a dev SDB and I accidentally typed SDB rather than SDA, then, you know, I'd, I'd wipe out my SDB when I really meant SDA is the one that I wanted to wipe out. So by copying and pasting, it reduces the potential for um, an, an error occurring and, and you know deleting the whole whole system preventing the machine from working for example so uh, if I run that you can see it emulates the um, wiping it's as if it's done it I know it hasn't done it because KDE has popped up here with the device it's emulated as if it's wiped it um, and KDE seen something happen to the USB and it said, oh, there's a new USB. It's popped in. You can see it's seen it, that there's something there to mount onto the system. So you can see that it's definitely only done it as a dry run. So that looks to me okay. It's a DOS partition. It's got the signature 55AA, which is correct. So I haven't got any other DOS partitions on the system. I know it's correct. So what I'm going to do now is to remove that N and actually perform the deletion and you'll see this time KDE hasn't popped up saying there's a, a partition to mount because that partition has been deleted so now if I do fdisk minus L on dev SDA you can see it's now empty it's not completely wiped with zeros but there's no partition information on there so what I'm going to do next is to create the partitions and I'll just refer back to the book here's lots of lots of information there about how to create it it doesn't give anything specific because everybody's situation is going to be different um, generally you'll want a root partition um, probably a boot partition and probably a swap partition so what I shall do is I'll go into fdisk and I want to make sure I'm operating on the right device so it's this one here and you can see by default it wants to create a DOS disk label you might want to change that to GPT I'm going to keep it as a DOS because it's only a small uh, USB device but say if it's a larger hard disk uh, you may want to change that to GPT and you can do that by uh, typing G and it will convert the partition table to a, a GPT partition table. So the first thing I'm going to do is to create a new partition um, and do that with N and it's going to be a primary partition so I'll just accept the default, accept the default for the first partition, accept the default for the um, initial sector which is 2048 
then the last sector now there's two there's a choice here to be made um, generally if it's a system that you're going to keep or if you're building Linux from scratch alongside another system you'll probably want to have a separate boot partition if it's alongside another system that system probably already has a separate boot partition where it's, where you, it's a place where you can put the kernel and where you need to modify grub to um, add LFS to the boot menu um, for the Development. What I'm doing, like what I'm doing here, you know, just demonstrating, or if it's just, uh, you know, I'm just going through the motions to create a Linux from scratch system, to learn from it. Uh, creating a separate boot partition is a bit more complexity. It's not a lot, great deal more, but it's a bit more complexity. So I tend not to do it in this situation. But if it's a system that I was building to use, I would thoroughly recommend a separate boot partition because. It means that the boot partition doesn't need to be mounted when the system boots and it kind of protects the kernel files that are on there. So it's a little bit more secure having a, um, a boot partition separate and not automatically mounting. You know, you might be as root, you might do a delete command that would normally delete things in the boot partition. But if it's not mounted and it's separate, then it offers a little bit of protection. In this example, I'm not going to bother with a separate boot partition um, because I'm just doing a demonstration. Uh, it, it just keeps things a little bit simple. And like I say, if you're learning this, you're doing this for the first, second, third time, you're still trying to get on top of how Linux from scratch works, then I think it's probably best just to stick with creating a single uh, file system, single root part, uh, boot part, root partition, sorry, uh, for for this um, build so I need it to be quite large um, if you're creating a swap partition you'll need to reserve some space for that so you might want to say um, I need a two gigabyte swap partition you can specify it like that um, okay you can still see the previous partition there so I'm so the YPFS has only deleted the entry in the partition like if you if like in the um, the header of the USB stick is not wiped anything as such and that's why FDisk can still see the stuff on on the USB stick so yes I do want to remove the signature and what I've done there now is I've created a partition but this was to be my swap partition so I need to type T to change the partition designation you can type L to see the different numbers um, and if you look at 82, that's the number for a Linux swap. So currently it's 83. You can see there's some aliases here. You can actually type in swap or 82. So I've never done this before. I always typed in 82. But if I type in swap, you can see it says it's changed it. If I do P now to view the partition, you can see that it's changed to swap. And then to create the actual root partition, I do... N again, new primary, the next partition number is two, first sector accept the default, and the last sector again accept the default. And you can see it's created for me a 12 gig partition of type Linux. And that's fine, I could write that, and that'll be the USB stick partitioned. Probably don't want to put a swap partition on a USB stick. Um, generally, most modern machines come with enough memory to allow uh, a system to run without swap um, if it's a system that you're building on a hard disk for a machine you want to run and use day to day you probably do want to think about creating a swap partition in this case I don't want to so I'm just going to delete these start again and all I'm going to do is create one root partition so create a new partition, primary, default partition one, first sector is accept the default, last sector accept the default. That VFAT signature is still there because I didn't write to the USB what I'd done before. So I'll just do yes again to tell it I do want it overwritten. Press P to see what I've done. That looks fine to me. So now I'm going to do W to write it and that has been written to and you can see fdisk has dropped me back to the prompt so now if I do fdisk minus l slash dev 
slash SDA. There is the data that's been written, so you can see it's all been stored correctly. The next thing I need to do is to format this partition. So what I'll do now is to copy the command they've got here to create an ext4 type partition. Um, again, a USB you might want to consider using ext2, um, which will be a little bit faster. It will certainly have less impact on the USB stick because there's no journal maintained. Um, I'm going to stick with ext4, I think, just for this demonstration. Uh, it's probably not going to make that much of a difference, but I'll do ext4 in case you are building on a real hard disk. You can see um, it's a bit more lifelike in that case. So dev sda again, make sure you're getting the right device. So that's why I've copied and pasted the um, actual designation for the device. In fact, that's the wrong device because I don't want to format the whole device itself. It's the partition I want to format. So that's the bit I need to copy. So this might take a little while. Okay, that was a lot quicker than I thought it would be. And you can see KDE is identified as a new partition that could be mounted. And so it came up with that pop-up. There's information there about creating the swap device. So if I create the swap device, I'd need to run that command as well. Now, before I go on any further, as I say, I'm not going to build directly onto the USB device because it's going to be a little bit slow. Potentially, writes are certainly slow to USB devices. Reads, not necessarily so. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, create an image of the USB stick now that I've created the partition on it. Um, I think I'm, going to try, I'm not sure if this will work as an ordinary user, but I'm going to try it. I'm going to use DD to copy the USB. And I'm going to copy the whole lot, the whole device. So it includes the... Um, boot sector, the partition table, anything else that's on the disk and I specify the input file is the USB device. The output file is going to be my LFS 11.1 and I'll call it .disk for example to show that it's a disk image. Uh, I'll specify block size of 64k so it, it copies fairly quickly. If you leave the, it should always specify block size and if you use the default of 512 bytes per sector it's quite slow copying. Uh, so using something a little bit bigger like 64k is a reasonable size will copy a lot, lot quicker. And I'm also going to add on another command called status equals progress and this will give me some information as it's copying as to how long it's going, uh, how it's doing. I'm also going to time this command to see how long it takes. Yeah, okay, so permission denied, I can't do it. So I'll have to become root again. And I'll just copy this command. Like so, paste that in. And just wait for this to copy. So it's, it's only, as I say, 14, 15 gigs, so it's already done a gigabyte. And it's only reading as well, so it should be relatively fast. When we write this image back to the USB, it will probably take a little bit longer. Okay, so that's copied. We've created a an image of the USB. So let's take a look at that. And there it is there. So what I'm going to do now is to move that into the kernel text directory. Uh, right, let's get my brain working correctly. So LFS into home kernel text. Now I'm going to go into home kernel text. Um, I'm going to change the owner 
of that file to kernel text. And I'm going to attempt to do the rest as the normal user. So what I need to do now, I've got this image here, I need to mount this as if it was um, an actual partition. And if I carry on with the manual, we'll see why we, why and where we need to put this. So they've got this export LFS, this was mentioned before, this LFS feral. This is really important because this is the destination of the partition that we're going to build LFS on. So if I put that in, we've now got a variable called LFS which points at a location which currently doesn't exist yet. Um, but will exist eventually. So what we need to do is to make that so so that we can mount um, yeah so I'm going to create that directory there so when we get our partition up we can mount it at that point um, yeah, I suppose really I should do the rest of this as root. Um, I could have done this another way, I think, and just done everything as kernel text, but it's probably simpler if I show it done as root. Um, it would be more natural. So, yeah, this file here is an image of the USB stick. We need to create this, emulate it as... Um, as if it was mounted as a partition, as if it was a real device. Currently it's only a file now. Um, and to do that we do something called um, LO setup. We set up a, something called a loop device in Linux. And with low setup, loop back setup, we specify a couple of switches. Um, P is for partitions to interpret partitions and um, there's F as well, I can't remember what that's for now, I presume it's to specify the file uh, let's have a look at the help uh, F, oh find, yeah, for, right, okay, yeah so when you do low setup you can specify the loop device explicitly but F will use the first available device. So assuming we've got no loop set, loop devices set up, it will use loop zero. Um, you know, if loop zero has already been in use, it would use loop one and so on. And then as you can see, P, the minus capital P, it does a partition scan and creates uh, the partitions on the loop device. So if I do those switches again, so P for the partitions, F to use the next available um, loopback device and it's the file we need to specify and that will have set up the device if I do low setup on its own you can see it tells us that the loop setup of uh, the loop device it's selected is loop device 0 dev loop 0 and you can see the back end file is the image of the USB stick we um, specify uh, we took an image of and you can see by default it's using 512 byte logical sectors so that's that's fine um, so now this is mounted as a loop back, loop back, back device we can actually do an F disk and it will show us this device and any partitions that are on it. So here's the device here. Disk dev loop zero as, as it was specified in low, low setup. And you can see within that we've got one partition which is the partition I created 
on the USB device. So that partition is now called, instead of it previously being called Dev SDA 1, that's as it was on the physical hardware, on the physical USB stick. Within this file, it's now referred to as Dev Loop 0 P1. So that's basically loopback device 0, partition 1. That's how that's broken down. So we can now mount that as per the instructions. The only difference is rather than it being a dev SDA device or whatever, as you can see here, they've got slash dev something. Um, we're using this dev loop zero P1 device. So I'll, I'll double click that to highlight it. Um, we've, uh, we've already actually created the LFS device. So let's just check we've got LFS set. We haven't. So let me recall the command. Have I got the command to set it up? No, I haven't. Okay, so export LFS equals forward slash MNT slash LFS. And if you remember, that already exists because we've already created it. If I remove that directory, just so that we can use the commands they've they've got in the book. You'll see they've added P to add any earlier directory. So for example, if the MNT directory didn't exist, it would create that automatically for us. And the V just shows us what's happening. And you can see make the created directory MNT LFS. And now we can mount the partition. This is the virtual partition on the image that we took the, from the USB. So if I copy that, remove this bit here because I want to copy the actual loopback device, which is that. We've now mounted the partition within that image on the file of the USB stick, if you like, if, if that makes sense. So I'll go through it again. We had the USB stick with the partition we created formatted it as ext4. I then took an image of that USB stick. The image I called lfs 11one.disk I've then mounted that image as a loopback device. That loopback low setup has given us access to the partition that we created, but it's within the image. And I've now mounted that partition in the image onto the file system. So now if I do DF minus H, you can see that that loopback image <coughs> has actually been mounted on the file system at MNT LFS. So that's what we'll be working with. So it does mean that, although it's not obvious, <coughs> this file is in use at the moment because we've got the partition within that uh, disk image mounted here. And I can do mount to see that. There it is there. Dev loop P1. And again, I can do low setup, which shows us that the loopback device is, is that actual file that we created. Um, if you're using other partitions, there's instructions there for mounting them. And also if you're using a swap device, which I'm not going to, I've got plenty of memory. Um, I would say, <sighs> There's a bit of a guesstimate, but I'd say if you've got four gigabytes or more um, for four threads, you probably won't need much. Uh, you probably wouldn't need a, a swap file. Um, that's allowing a roughly one gigabyte per thread. Um, I'm, I wouldn't take that as an absolute figure. Uh, you may find that it might be a little bit more than one gigabyte. The one that probably will cause problems, GCC, is the one where you might run out of memory. Um, it might be like 1.2 or 1.5 gigabytes per thread that's needed. But generally, 4 gigabytes is probably the absolute minimum amount of RAM to, to get a compile done on, on more than one thread. Um, certainly up to about 4 threads, I would, I would have said. So if you are restricted for RAM, and you think it might be a problem, I'd thoroughly recommend creating a swap file somewhere just to prevent that from happening. 